Meeting is called to order. From 6.15 to 7, we were in executive session talking about a personnel matter. Um, pig students that are here, if we go till 9 o'clock, we will stop and then we will let you go. But if, unfortunately, if you're here till 9 o'clock and we're not done, you have to stay. Just make sure to sign out the sign out sheet right here. And if we can all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Introductions. Dave Hurst. Charmaine Widgesinger. Holly Dellenbaugh. Michael Cooper. Jody Monroe. Christine Beck. Lynn Lynn Hart. Jonathan Fishbein. Meredith Moyarty. Judy Kehoe. Can we have a motion to approve the, uh, approve the minutes of the September 6, 2017 meeting? So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Superintendent report? Aye. Oh, I skipped over student senate report. Is there a member of the student senate here? I guess we can skip over it then. <laughs> Superintendent report. Uh, thank you. Um, just one announcement. Last night we had our first uh, K-5 Community Activities Fair. Uh, this was an effort by the district's coordinated health team to provide families with information about available opportunities in the community. Uh, we had uh, just about 30 organizations uh, that came. It was a great representation of activities and we had a great turnout of our families. So hopefully it was uh, helpful and we hope to continue it in the future. So that's my report. That's it. Next up is the Board of Education report. Does anybody have anything um, that they would uh, like to discuss? I have something. I just I meant to mention it at the last meeting, and it's in my mind. But the week before um, school started, I went to the kindergarten bus orientation. And I just wanted to really commend um, our transportation department on a really wonderful program. Uh, they did a great job communicating with both the children and the parents. Um, the two, there was two women who were running it and I've forgotten their names so I would like to email the transportation department just to say what a wonderful job they did. Um, and it's very hard to get a room full of four and five year olds who have not even been to kindergarten yet to sit and listen and truly <coughs> understand and they did a wonderful job of um, communicating with them the rules and the expectations and also assuring the parents. They just did a really wonderful job and I feel like we have a very professional uh, transportation department and it put s several parents who uh, were brand new parents to the district talked to me and said that they felt so much better putting their children on the bus. Uh, so I wanted to make sure oh, that's great. we knew that that was a wonderful program. That's great. Um, I also uh, received last week a notice um, from the counseling department at Ellesmere that um, they were having a banana splits program. I don't know if Elsmere had had it in previous years, um, or I don't know if other schools have it as well, but I just wanted to say that I think that's a wonderful program, um, and I'm so glad that our schools are implementing it. Um, it used to be something that, uh, if people don't know what Banana Splits is, it's a, a group of children who are affected by their divorce or separation or a change in their family structure um, can get together and just talk. Um, and talk or not talk, but just be together um, with uh, someone who is trained in dealing with certain situations like that. And I think it's a wonderful program, and I'm so glad that our schools are implementing it. All of our schools do offer that. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have for a while, correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, it, it's something that uh, our court system used to do and no longer does. So I think it's mm. important that the schools are taking, taking up. I had a couple. Well, I had a couple things. Another board member asked, "How many um, students here tonight are alums of Glenmont?" Very exciting. So this could be your last time in Glenmont. Isn't that exciting? Do you feel like you you have any? Uh, you miss it? <laughs> That's awesome. I also wanted to ask. And I wasn't sure, I guess it's a question for Jody and Dave, just a couple parents had mentioned to me, so I don't know if, if this is a trend, but do we do any type of Aspen training for incoming sixth graders? Because as elementary students, they're not really using Aspen to check on their grades. 
and then when they come into sixth grade, do do we do some type of orientation in the they first? So day typically, the teachers um, do the training with both the Aspen and Google Classroom um, okay. within the first few days of orientation. When they're getting the students acclimated to the Chromebooks, they'll oh. also walk them through um, whatever skills they need to be able to access what the teacher does in Aspen or Google Classroom. And how to find documents for sure for homework. Okay, great. Thank you. Mike, do you want to say anything about Gilderland? Hmm? Do you want to say anything about Gilderland? Do you want to say anything? Okay. Well, anyway, oh. Mike and I went to a meeting in Gilderland. <laughs> 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 we, we, went we went to the Gilderland School Board meeting um, because they had a speaker there about starting the high school um, uh, time there. Uh, they had a guest speaker starting high school later, and uh, we took. I took a lot of notes. And, um, it was a very interesting presentation that that district. I think it was Glens Falls did not provide busing, and they're a smaller district, and the high school and the middle school are the same campus. So basically, all three levels start at 8.30 now, um, with some changes. But they talked about the education they do with parents and teachers, some pushback they got, but how they did it. But there were some, some similarities and some differences as well, just to go. Yeah, there were some benefits that they highlighted that were quite interesting. But as Charmaine said, um, they don't bus their students, so it was much easier for them as a district. And also, they only had to change schedules for the high school. They didn't have to change schedules for the other two levels. Um, so overall, for their district, the change was much easier to implement. Yes, yeah, so they didn't swap out a grade, for, uh, like a level for a level. It was everyone. They just changed. They ch I shouldn't say just, because it was a process that they described. Um, but that was the only level that really was affected. But as we look into it more, if their superintendent said if we're interested in having him come and do a presentation, he's more than happy to. So they started their elementary and their middle school already at 8.30, so they were already in sync. Is that what you're saying? Only the high school had to be changed? Right. Yeah, the high school start time may have been, I took all this, these notes, um, I forget. Um, and so because they were on the same campus as the middle school, they changed. Uh, the traffic pattern oh, okay. because parents basically dropped off their kids so they had to ch uh, reset some parking lots um, but they did it because of the, their overwhelming research um, they used the press quite a bit they did a lot of education with parents and students ahead of time um, and they did talk a bit about athletics and how um, sometimes kids did miss ninth period um, but basically for a lot of uh, the athletic concerns they were able to accommodate those and they also mentioned that there were um, AP classes and the, the more rigorous academic classes were generally not offered towards the end of the day. So they, okay. they, they loaded their, their um, class schedule towards the front. And you would think that, that that would be a little bit different with the studies because they're championing that the students aren't ready to start until later in the day, so you would still think that they would switch the AP classes towards the end of the day. That, yeah. I think that's an interesting switch. Yep. They probably didn't want to miss them. No, <laughs> no, I, 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 right. I, under, I understand, yeah. but it's yeah. you're kind of giving up one for the other. Right. Right. Yeah. I think, Mike, Mike, did you put the um, slides on the website? Did you, our our There's, email system? In or? that information yeah. I put together for the board, okay. their information is their actually included. Are they, they, in that, well, not the slides, but yeah. information about their process is actually right, right. included in that packet. And I emailed some material to the board last yeah. week. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Jody, I just wanted to say I, I did hear from a couple parents that went to the um, the fair yesterday and very much enjoyed it. Okay. And we're glad that you put it together. So, yeah. thanks. All right. Tonight we have a presentation by the K through 12 supervisor Nick Petrocioni, and he's going to be talking about the new assessment in global history and geography. And all you seniors here get to miss this. <laughs> I'm Laura Heffernan, the principal here at Glenmont School, and I wanted to welcome everyone. We are talking tonight about our social studies curriculum and specifically some changes at the high school um, with the assessments. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick Petricioni, and he's going to tell you all about it. Nick. Thank you. Um, the first thing I, I just want to mention, to give you a little historical context of how this is working, there are really three things that's happened in the last You should speak year. into them. I'm sorry. <laughs> there are really th three things that are happening. There's a new frameworks that were adopted in 2014 
There is a toolkit that was developed for teachers in 2015, and for this year, there, there's a new exam for our current 10th graders. And I'll try to walk through all of this with you. Um, to give you a sense of a timeline, a little historical context, the current 11th graders last year would have taken the old exam. That's a multiple choice section, um, a short answer responses, and then two essays, right? A thematic essay and a DBQ. This year, our current 10th graders are going to take the trans transitional regions exam, which is basically multiple choice, short answer responses based on documents, and two essays. It sounds very similar to the test that they already were taking the year before. The only difference and the major difference is that test is only for 10th grade content. So students are only expected to know 1750 to the present day, as opposed to students the year before that were asked to know everything from the beginning of time to the present day. So it took that two year sequence right out. That was one of the major changes that have happened that is happening this year. And if you look at this chart, you can see that this transitional exam is being phased out as the new exam is being phased in. So at some point in 2019, we as a district are gonna have to make a decision whether we wanna stay with the old, with the transitional exam, or move to the new exam. And that's something that we're really struggling, not struggling, but something that we're debating right now as to, you know, should we jump into something that we really didn't, we really haven't seen or don't know that much about? So we're really having some really um, honest and careful and thoughtful discussions about what that looks like. If you're looking at the new test, if you move forward sometimes, sometime in 2020, 2021, this is what it looks like. Multiple choice, short answer responses, essay. It sounds very similar, but it's very different. Multiple choice questions go from 50 to 25 to 30. They're all based on stimulus. Um, the short answer responses go from um, one set of documents where there's one question being asked of students to two sets of documents where there are perspectives where there might be three sets of questions asked of students. So it's becoming more and more of a skills-based test, a reading test, a comprehension test. And then there's still the essay, but it's only one essay. So psychologically, when you're talking to kids and you're going from 50 questions to 25 to short answer responses to only one essay, it looks really, really good. But we have yet to see what this test really looks like. And we haven't scored anything yet, so we don't know how that's going to work. But that is the new exam. And when you're looking at the essay portion, it gets to be a little overwhelming for teachers because we've never seen this essay before. But one of the nice things that we like about this essay is it will never change. On every Regents exam from the point that we start this test, this will be the essay. It will ask you the same thing year after year after year. What is the enduring issue and what is the impact on society? And using documents, the only thing that will change are the documents. Does that make sense? So for us, as teachers, that makes a lot of sense. We know exactly what's on the test. We know year after year what we want kids to do on that writing portion of the exam. The only problem that we have is we have to teach them how to figure out what an enduring issue is. So, so the enduring issue is embedded in the documents. It is. So they just can't think it up and then use the documents. Exactly. No essay documents. will ever be the same. Because okay. what one student sees as an enduring issue might not be the same as somebody else. And I'll okay. explain it this way. If you're looking at an enduring issue, they're going to give you a series of documents. In this particular case, it has the starvation in Ukraine, it has apartheid, it has boycotts. Somebody else might see something completely different. Does that make sense? But the enduring issue is human rights violations. So out of the five documents, they chose those three and they went with human rights. You can go with nationalism using those same documents. You can go with something like, um, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, conflicts around the world, something else as an enduring issue. So it all depends on what the kids see, but it will never be the same. So that's why we're a little concerned about the scoring part. We haven't seen it. So how do we really know? Usually when you get a document-based question, you know exactly what's being asked, and the documents fit exactly that question. Now you're asking the kids to come up with the question themselves. Here's the enduring issue, and now I'm going to take all this information and support that. That is the major change for us. So you're asking them to identify a theme that they see. Correct. So the best way it's been described, and I'm not sure this is accurate, but we have a thematic essay right now. We have a document-based question, and you're taking the two and merging them. That's really what it looks like. So kids have to learn how to identify what, a, what an enduring issue is. And it's something over the course of time. Poverty is an enduring issue. Immigration is an enduring issue. Climate is an enduring issue. Someday technology will be an enduring issue, I'm sure. But you get the idea. If a kid can defend it using the documents, right. it will be plausible. Um, so social studies, for the, for the, for the most part, is a, ver a vertical articulation. We know, based on the frameworks, exactly what teachers are supposed to teach at what level. And this is what it looks like. Right? So from K to 12, there are themes and content-specific areas that are taught at all different <coughs> levels. 
it's a real nice balance between the content and the skills that kids need to have in order to be successful in social studies. The frameworks provides a, a real nice guide and the tool, tool kit provides teachers with a lot of resources and the creativity it allows them to be really creative in what they're doing. And I'll try to explain the, the toolkit because I think it's something that we tend to overlook because it's someone did a, teachers did a really nice job with it. And then that, all, of course, leads to the new Regents exam. So when you're looking at the toolkit, it's a K-12 toolkit. Every single grade level has six inquiries. Those units are very long. So when you're looking at kindergarten and it says identity, that could be a two-week unit that a teacher can find themselves getting into or they can spend two days on it and move on to the next inquiry. So it really gives teachers a tremendous amount of flexibility what they can or cannot do. Does that make sense? Can, can I ask a yep. question? So with the, the revision to the, the new regents or Common Core, they want the, the kids to come up with a thesis, defend their thesis based on whatever information they provide. Is there gonna be a combined, and I guess this is a good question for Dave, as well, is there going to be a combined effort, I think, with English to work on really defining what a thesis is and so they're prepared in both areas? Yeah, you go ahead. Yes, and that actually, um, we've already begun those discussions, um, not just because of this new exam, but also because of the new ELA exam. Mm -hmm. um, again, some of the trends that we saw during my presentation last time was the difficulty that some of our Excel students were having with that exam. So we're, we're trying to take a look at um, what commonalities exist between the social studies curriculum and yeah. the English curriculum and how can we marry those so kids are sort of getting a double dose of it um, so that they're able to really better themselves on both exams through a joint effort. Yeah, I'm just thinking what a great opportunity for teachers and supervisors and the students to work together to kind of integrate the two of them and it's just, it has a lot of opportunities. Yeah, if you, if you remember from the last presentation that I did in Hamagrell, we bought into that, and we'll talk about that later, into okay. that BOCES ELA social studies program, which is designed specifically to integrate those yeah. two areas. We're doing that at the high school already. English and social studies teachers are constantly talking about research papers and claims and the vocabulary that, that, we, that they use in their classrooms versus the cap vocabulary that we're using in social studies classrooms, and we're trying to mirror the two of them. So there is, no, there is no doubt that this particular new framework that exists, it mirrors what's going on in English, and it mirrors science is only right behind us in that sense, too. So you're starting to see more of that articulation. But the, the good thing about the toolkit for me is that whole idea of a mile long, inch deep, no longer exists with the toolkit, because it allows teachers to get really involved in certain units of study, where it gives kids a real sense of what's going on in social studies. And the best way I can explain that to you is when I was looking at this recently, um, when it first came out, and I, I went to fifth grade, and I loved the titles. I'd like to see what are the titles of these inquiries, and I saw bananas. I said, what does bananas have to do with fifth grade? But when you start to really think about it, and you realize that someone used something so small and insignificant in some ways to, ex to explain something very, very complicated, you realize how important bananas are. Because when you go forward, you said, what's the real cost of bananas? And you're not talking about money anymore. You're talking about labor. You're talking about global markets, free trade, the rights and responsibility of governments versus corporations. You're starting to get into things that I never thought a fifth grader could really understand. And by buying something that costs you 59 cents a pound at ShopRite, they can really understand what, what, that, what that concept is. So what is the real cost of bananas? To me is like, okay, well, what's the real cost of democracy today? You can ask that. What's the real cost of um, a conflict in North Korea, economic sanctions? It's enormous. What we're dealing with right now is pretty significant for kids' lives. So any time that we make something relevant, and bananas may sound funny, but the concept behind this is really powerful. And so the toolkit gives teachers that, that, that kind of freedom to say, wow, I'm going to really do this unit and do it really, really well, because it fits into something that I want to do with ELA, if that makes any sense to you. Can, can you go back either one or two slides? And the numbers there, are those like corresponding to a unit They're corresponding content? to the actual framework, so 5.2, 5.3, those kind of things. Within okay, the and so this, and this content and instructional material yep. based it's on all there. unit 5.1. Yeah, oh, if this it. was an active slide and I would hit bananas, you'd get like 45 got pages it. of resources, okay. documents, video clips, all that kind of stuff. There's right. no place, it's like you only go to one place to get that information. Right. There's no more textbooks anymore. Everything is right there in front of you. Got it. Thank and you. if I extend that even further, if you look at something like, I know we have a lot of seniors yeah. here, and and you look at 12th grade and you look at their in participation in government class and you look at this and you just say, okay, we've got federalism, the First Amendment, voting, uh, political parties, campaign finance, and then the ACA. I don't know about you, but that was our last election. 
yeah. right? That's what we're dealing with right now. This was written three years ago. So someone had the foresight to understand what really matters. And to kids right now, the ACA, I know you're not really thinking about that, but for someone whose kids just graduated from college and you say, Dad, what do I do about health care? That mattered to me. I finally started to understand what exactly is going on with the ACA. So I understand the problems behind it. I understand the penalty that you have to pay if you don't sign up for it, who signs up for it. So you guys someday may have to deal with that, but this is important to have some sort of idea of what it is. So the toolkit allows teachers to get into things that they would have never really discussed before, and it provides all the resources for those teachers. So something like who exactly is covered by the ACA? Who are these uninsured people? I mean, we hear about that all the time. We hear about DOC and UNDOC. Who are they? Like, can you really define who they are? This will help us get there. And it gives teachers all the resources and, and the, um, the creativity and the knowledge to do that. You spoke about um, no more textbooks. So well, not no more, but we're getting away from it. Okay. <laughs> Online resources. What is what is the is there a cost to this, or is this provided to the school? This I mean, is actually all free. Okay, this is created by teachers for teachers through the New York State Education Department. So at the, some point, if we're going to be eliminating textbooks, there's going to be savings to this. There could be yes. Um, but I don't want to go there because we're actually are buying into some digital textbooks too. So that's the next. So okay. I'll try to explain it. Yes, there is a savings right now. We, I mean, how many seniors like carrying those big books around? You shouldn't have any. You don't have a giant economics book or a participation in government book. We're trying to move away from that because we we still have books in the high school. You probably don't like this, but in the 1990s and maybe in the 70s in some cases, we're trying to we're trying to get away from that. Okay. Um, and so I'll just hand it over to Laura a little bit to kind of showcase what's going on here at um, at Glenmont. I just want to ask one question. How sure. many seniors are taking economics right now? And how many think asking the question the real cost of bananas might have helped you in economics right now? Does anybody mm -hmm. think that that would help? I, I mean, it correlates to what you're doing right now. And only two, so they're not very no, no, but I was looking over my daughters and it said the cost of absenteeism in the schools. And I think what a great correlation to be able to do that at such a young age and bring yeah, it forward I, with you in each I year. I think if you ask these guys, you know, what are they willing to give up to get an iPhone or something like that, you're going to find a very interesting answer. Mm -hmm. So they're starting, to, they're starting to get that idea of what's yeah. the opportunity cost. What am I willing to do in order for something else to happen? Um, and eventually they will understand that in terms of economics. But it is week two, so. Yeah. So because we're at Glenmont Elementary School, we thought it would be good to cover a little bit of the whole K-12 philosophy, too, of social studies and how things have changed. So back in the days when some of us were students, um, it seemed that social studies was all about memorization. You had to memorize dates, the names of the presidents, the causes of World War II, et cetera, et cetera. But now for students K through 12, the focus is more on these practices. We want our students to go beyond the level of memorization. We want them to gather information firsthand, to draw conclusions, to interpret documents, to determine causation, to compare and contrast, and to become involved citizens. So you can see here this picture. This is our fourth graders at the New York State Capitol last spring. We bring our fourth graders to Albany every year. And um, Mackenzie Regal, one of our fourth grade teachers, is in the audience. She takes them on that trip, along with our other fourth grade teachers. And uh, they get the benefit of seeing where New York State government happens firsthand. So we're not just talking about being citizens. We're be, you know, they're actually becoming citizens, even as fourth graders. We also um, focus on gathering, interpreting, and using evidence, another one of the, the practices. So what does this look like for young children? Well, you can see a photo here from our wax museum, which we do in third grade, as some of the other schools do too. Um, this photo is two of our third graders. And oops, did I go backwards? Sorry. There we go. Um, what they do is they read five short biographies of famous people and with the emphasis on the understanding of why the person is important and the time period in which they lived. They select one, they gather information from different sources, and then synthesize it into a monologue written in the first person. And then they dress as their character, and they perform their speech as staff and, stu and uh, other students and parents walk around, and, and they change from wax characters to perform with a coin. And uh, it's a great opportunity that, for them to learn a lot about historical figures 
and they also take the money that they raise and they use it to um, for a community donation and the teachers like to say that they're raising the money and helping people just like the people in, in history who made a difference in, in our lives. We also um, focus on chronological reasoning and causation as an important skill for our students to learn. And geographic reasoning. So no longer is it stressed that students memorize the 50 state capitals. You can Google that. That's easy to do. Instead, they consider how geography has shaped history. So look at the borders of New York State. Look at the Erie Canal. Sorry, I keep hitting it. <laughs> um, why is New York State important in history? Um, we want our students to understand what caused Albany to become the capital of New York State and what happened in history here. And back to textbooks, at the elementary level, we have adopted this, thanks to Nick, um, this integrated social studies ELA curriculum. So again, we're marrying the social studies and the ELA and try to bring them together. So teachers can pull resources from this extremely rich website, which teachers are still exploring all the time, trying to find new things. Um, and here at the elementary level, we do focus a lot on reading, writing, and math. So it's a great opportunity for us to pull the social studies into the reading and the writing. And there's so much to the website that the teachers are still picking and choosing. And um, it's a constant work in progress, and we're extremely lucky to have this resource. So I'm going to turn it back over to Nick to talk some more about secondary. Yes. Um, so if you look at this particular resource, when we first bought this three years ago, it was only a K-5. They've added six, seven, and eight since then that match the frameworks in the toolkit. So it's very much designed just like the toolkit is, where a teacher could go into one of those levels. And I wish it's not live, but if you go into something, you can click on it and it gives you all the resources from the reading material to the actual lesson plan to the standards. It gives you everything you really need, including videos. Now, the nice thing about this is this saves us a lot of money because if you think about the fiscal part of this, it's about $2,500 a year for every elementary person in the building, in all of our buildings. Um, as opposed to buying books that would, we are talking maybe $100,000. So this saves us a lot of money. What I like about this is it's created by teachers in the classroom right now. It evolves over the course. Every time something's added or every some time something's changed, a teacher can come here and find those changes and any resources that they want. So the, 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 the period of time where a teacher says, I don't know what to do in social studies, all you got to do is click grade two and you're going to find exactly what you're supposed to do. It's broken up into four units. Within those units, there are lesson plans. And again, you have the flexibility and the creativity as a teacher to decide this fits really well into what I'm doing with ELA or it doesn't. And you can make those decisions. You don't have to do everything, but you have to do some things, if that helps. The other thing that we started this year, whoops, yes, I'm sorry. The other thing that we started this year, thanks to Dave, is we actually started piloting an online digital textbook at the middle school. So when we went to Chromebooks this year, we said, okay, we don't want those kids to carry those books home anymore. What can we do? So we are working on this right now. And right now, the seventh grade teacher, one particular teacher loves it. She absolutely adores this thing right now. I couldn't really tell you exactly how to use all of it. It's got a lot of bells and whistles, but the kids have access to it. And it serves, again, it follows the frameworks. It follows the New York State scope and sequence. It follows the toolkit. It's designed very similarly. So I think we're, we're heading in that direction of trying to save money, be fiscally responsible, for providing teachers as many resources as we possibly can. The other thing that I just want to mention, we're very fortunate to live in a district that supports um, professional development. So one of the nice things about what's happening lately is we live right outside of Albany. The New York State Conference for Social Studies is right here in Albany. We'll be here for the next couple years. Um, Dave has been really good. Jody's been really good at providing resources for teachers to go. So anytime there's an SED update, anytime something changes, we send anywhere between 10 and 15 teachers to the conference every year for one year. And so they get the most updated information as we possibly can. The other piece I wanted to mention is that I like to think that Bethlehem is like a beacon for other school districts. We tend to do a lot of things before everybody else. And I don't know if it's just because of our location or the fact that there are people within the department or myself who are very involved at the state level. But we have hosted, last year we hosted um, a mini conference right here at, in Del Mar. This year we're doing the exact same thing. If you notice on the bottom, it says an update on the new assessment. So state ed will be in the high school helping teachers understand the new exam. We did that last year, June 1st and 2nd, where 
we had a three hour workshop where Donna Merlot and Dan King came to the high school. There are 40 plus teachers and we sat in a room for three hours and talked about what exactly is an enduring issue. So we're trying to do the best we can to help teachers understand the changes that are coming down the pipe. We're, we're doing the best we can to serve as a model for other school districts. And I feel very proud that we have teachers that actually do these things on their own free time and that the district supports us um, when we do that. The last thing, if you're really interested in all of this, I gave you a link there. You can actually go and watch the videos that explain part one, part two, part three, and narrated by SED if you've got free time. But that is social studies in 15 minutes, maybe. Any I have, questions? I have questions. Sure. So is it going to change to two exams versus the one in 10th grade, so there would be the one eventually after ninth grade, one after 10th grade, is that? No, nope, we're only gonna have one exam at the end of 10th grade. So we would look to do a final exam in ninth grade if that's the choice we, or the avenue. Correct, we, we still have a final, we're not there yet. Like we're deciding whether that, that time that we give to midterms and finals are actually taken away from the instructional time that we need. Okay. So we, we're really having some honest, thoughtful conversations about instructional time. But at some point, we have to have a diagnostic measure before they get to 10th grade. So would you, do you feel that, because you said you had concerns because you hadn't seen the exam, and you won't see the exam, correct, until it's administered for the first time, or well, do you get a preview? Yeah, I, I included a prototype for you guys, and if not, I can show you what that looks like. We have a general idea of what the test looks like. Okay. We're just not sure how it's going to be scored. So the thing that I didn't mention, I probably should mention, that the exam this year is on June 5th. It's a little earlier. And then, of course, we send, we score the exam as best we can, given the kind of parameters that we're going to be given. And then two weeks later, at the end of the scoring period, we're finally going to get the results, which is a little bit different. Usually when we score the exam, we get the results within a day or two. Um, but that's the transitional piece. So we're, we're going to have a sense of what that test looks like and what the expectations are for that exam. And the more we take that exam, the better, you know, that exam is a, an evolution. Like every year, or every time it's administered, it gets closer to what the exam is really going to look like. So. The department, we had a, a, a pretty long discussion about this yesterday, like there is no rush to take the new test until we really understand what it is. If it's not going to help our students, why then why subject our students to one exam that we really don't know what the outcome is or an exam or two exams because that's a lot of pressure for kids because these are time sensitive exams. This takes a long yes. time to write the essays and to do the documents. So we want to do what's right for kids. So they won't get their scores, they'll be delayed. They'll get their scores probably June 21st, 22nd. Right. Oh, okay. We don't know how that's going to work. Okay. And so you're at, is that what the apprehension is? You said there were reasons you were concerned. Is that most? That, my concern is not really knowing what a four is, what a five okay. is on an essay. I mean, I know what it is right now. We've had a lot of practice at scoring exams. We can look at an exam and look at an essay and get a pretty good sense of what it is based on the scoring matrix. But without that, before the exam starts, it's really hard to know where the kids fall. So we're going to be told later what the scores are. But there's positive. It looks like there's going to be positive. Yeah, psychologically, it looks times. great. I mean, 25 multiple choice questions, only one essay. It looks fantastic. Okay. But then there's that concern of the unknown, knowing like okay. if I don't know what it looks like, how comfortable are we really going through this? It'd be nice to see the exam. We have time. That's what I keep talking about. We have time to actually look at this test evolve. We don't have to take the first administration of the new exam if we don't want to. Okay. Um, some schools have said we're not going to do that. We're going to wait until three years later. <laughs> some schools have said no, we're going to take both exams. Some schools say no, we're going to go right into it. I know that we have we've been preparing this since um, since 2014 when the frameworks was accepted. We started this process. Our middle school teachers are ready to go with this new with this new stuff. But our high school still realize that they, they've got to bridge the gap between the old exam and the new exam, and they're and they're different. There's no way around it. Could we do the two like we did in now, Dave? I mean, because the kids seem to like that, to have the option to pick the better of the two, and it takes a little stress off. We could. The only difference between this and the math exams is just the, the intensiveness of the, the writing. The writing. This. You're talking about some, some pretty significant writing. No, I know, I know. And so for our kids who struggle, this might be real. This might be a real problem, Difficult. a real challenge for them. Mm -hmm. But so we don't have want to the put, option to take both or one? Or? Um, we don't know yet. We haven't gotten an answer from the state yet. Okay. We, they, um, you know, every time I ask that question to Donna Merlot, who's one of the associates at SED, it's, it's, it's a local decision. We're not going to force you to do one or the other. But at some point, they will tell us what they will allow and won't allow. Thank you. I'm sure if you ask the students, they would say one test or two. I don't know, some of these I mean, kids were in, they had the option to take geometry or algebra to test. So what would you prefer? I'm just curious, who would like two tests to have the option? <laughs> well, 
there's like five who would just like one test and no option. Split. split. Yeah, it's split. a split room. So we'll let you know. At some point, yeah, we're going to have to make those choices. The nice thing is we don't have to rush, is what I'm saying. We can really take our time with this. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Laura. Sorry, I left you off in the beginning. I didn't realize. Mm -hmm. Great presentation, by the way. Yeah. Thank you Great very much. Suffer. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to recognize any visitors on an agenda item. Is there anybody here who would like to speak on an agenda item? Okay. Item number eight, finance. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following finance action items one through two. So, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, um, any abstentions? Motion carries. And just to thank um, Young Landscaping for their donation for the middle school stage project. Item number nine, professional personnel is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following professional personnel action items one through eight. So moved. Second. Motion to approve. Did Vote. I hear a motion? Yeah, there's yeah. a first and second. First oh, okay, second. I didn't hear you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10, support personnel. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following support staff action items one through nine. So moved. Second. Motion to, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Uh, item number 11, other action items. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following action items one through four. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, we have to have some discussion here though. Oh, any? There's a voting delegate. Oh. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, for the. Uh, I, I'd be willing to be the alternate. <laughs> the alternate? <laughs> well, anyone going to the convention, so, so I'd be the alternate. I don't know if anyone has that burning desire. Linda, you could already do it anyway, or? Uh, no, it would be better if I didn't do it. I mean, it should be maybe one of, one of our new members. I don't know what I'm thinking, maybe Christine. Christine does. Does. Well, so they have this well, business they have, meeting, they, have they give you this paddle that says yay or nay, okay. and all that stuff that's on the, port, the, the website or the um, email list, I think the, all the resolutions are on there, right. and they ask, by di they say all districts approve, and you put up the yay. You were, you were, I've, I've done it yeah. a few times. I, I think it's quite interesting because there's a lot of you know, discussion and debate mm -hmm. about the various resolutions and then there's, they take a vote, and that's where you raise your paddle, whether you're voting yay or nay on it. Um, I think it's an interesting process. Some people it don't is. think so, but I no. it's and, and if you have the alternate, they likes it. I can do it. I don't have a problem. It's, but if anybody, if one of the new board members would like to have the opportunity to go and experience it, or if not, I, I'm okay not doing it. You're okay not doing it? <laughs> there is an orientation my, be session for the delegates so that you, yeah. you know, My you question is, are you voting as a representative, a representative of our whole board? So do we discuss um, how you would be voting, or is that something we just entrust in you? Well, we I can kind of entrust, but I think it's helpful if there are any, you know, to look them over. And, right. and there's time for the next meeting. Yeah, we can that talk if there, about it. If there's any controversial ones or ones that you feel maybe you should, that yes. you would be unsure how to vote. That we, yeah. yeah, that's we what they've done in the past. People I mean, say, well, on, on this one in particular, I want to know the, the will of the board. And, okay. uh, and then if you have an alternate, you just make, you can say, okay, Charmaine, come in at 10. You can just, I'll switch off with you if you want a break, because <laughs> otherwise you're in there. So. Um, I'll, I'll step in and you step out and I vote while you're out or whoever well, the person is. Christine, if you'd like to do that, that's fine. Oh, look at that. Look at the old. I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> I mean, I'd be happy to do it. If no, you it's not. I don't okay. mind. I haven't done it, so it'll be an experience. Would you want to be the alternate? I, I'd love to be an alternate. Okay, so she'll, she'll be the alternate. <laughs> okay. There you go. Now, do we have to vote on that? or we're Yeah, just well, we usually do. It doesn't hurt. I'll make a motion. Should, uh, second. For Christine to be yeah, second or whatever it is. Delegate and Meredith being the alternate. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. So for the next meeting, then it's helpful to look at these. Take a look at that. Okay. okay. Speaking, speaking of the convention, what I would suggest is the, the four of us who are going, perhaps at the next meeting, in one of those onboard publications, they had the whole schedule of workshops. 
if maybe either before the meeting or after, just to spend a couple of minutes and circle some different things because it's it's helpful to not all four of us to go to the same presentation. Mm -hmm. So if something if someone says I really want to go to this one, it's like okay, then you go to that and I'll go to this, just so we spread it out. So if we could bring the schedule, if you have it, yeah, so we, we can do, do that. that. Mm -hmm. But I also I, I believe if somebody wants to overlap, I think people should go yeah. to things that they're interested in because it makes it a little more. Well, sure. I think I think there's always been some well. overlap, but it's also helpful to say okay, yeah, I agree. you know, it's like. We don't want to be going to all the same things. So what we do is we bring the resources back to the rest of the board. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So. Item number 12, recognition of visitors on a non-agenda item. We, I, I don't know, if, did we oh. approve the other things? We, yes. we did. Uh, number 11? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, you know, I no, thought we right. did it all together, but we can go back. Did we well, we just did the voting The delegates. delegates. Okay, did thank the you. Delegate. We didn't. All right, so vote on everything else. So it's one, two, and four. All right, so we had the discussion, but we didn't need the vote. Sure, yes. sure. Uh, let's start again. It, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following items: Action One through Four. We already talked about Number Three. Motion to approve. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, item Number Twelve: Recognition of visitors on a non-agenda item. Okay. And lastly, uh, future meeting and events. Uh, our next regular board meeting is scheduled for September the 9th, uh, what's today, sorry, Wednesday, October 4th at 6 o'clock. Glasses would be good. Uh, and it will be at the high school again. And then we have our first community forum on the district strategic planning on Wednesday, October 11th at 6.30 at the high school uh, LMC. And then uh, we have an anticipated uh, board executive session, 6 o'clock on Wednesday, October 18th at Slingerlands Elementary in our regular board meeting. And uh, that's it. Yeah. Kristen, before you end, yeah. uh, close the meeting, um, there's also the, the um, district, district Strategic Action Committee. The first meeting is August 28th, 2017. September 28th. Yes. Oh, that's the, that's the date. Oh, that's not on here. Yeah, the, okay. the, yeah, the date. Sorry, the date of the memo was August 28th. But yeah. Um, I want to just double check how the board was going to handle that because I know uh, three of us were going to attend the initial meeting. Had we decided if we're going to be the three ongoing members or are people going to be swapping in and out or does that matter? I thought um, we were going to see how after the first, first meeting, meeting we would decide. Okay, okay We'd bring it. back and talk about mm -hmm. kind of what the committee had discussed initially for the plan just to okay. determine how the board wanted to be involved. Yep. All right. Thank you. Okay. And motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All right. We are done. You Wait, guys got to